welcome everyone to lecture number nine for the last eight lecture, or well, actually seven lectures. You got to enjoy well-prepared, beautiful lectures by the PhD students. Now for the next two lectures, I'm going to take over and I'm gonna be less prepared, I can tell you. We've been talking about uh, linear algebra first. I guess that makes total sense because linear algebra is the foundation for everything. You can't really do computation if you don't know how to solve linear systems of equation. And then because it was natural to extend from the point of view of Gaussian process regression, we moved to simulation. And it turned out that simulation is actually quite a complicated problem. So for the next two lectures, will actually, I, well, first of all, I can tell you, you've now passed basically the hard, the hard stuff. So from now on, the rest of the course should be, if you've made it this far, it's gonna be fine for the rest of the course. Um, what we now move to for the next two lectures is ostensibly integration. And the reason we're doing it at this point was, well, okay, simulation was like naturally to follow up from Gaussian process regression. Integration will actually have a slightly different kind of character will use it l less as a direct means of some, to, to get to some tools you absolutely need to know, but more to reflect a bit on the, na the nature of computation as such and um, how to do it right. So when I say integration, I mean the kind of computations that we need to perform in machine learning when we do Bayesian inference. To do Bayesian inference, you have to compute conditional distributions, posteriors, using Bayes' theorem, and Bayes' theorem contains an integral, and it contains a joint distribution, and that integral is essentially kind of a marginal, right? So you can think of this marginal also as uh, the, an, an expected value of some conditional distribution. And then, of course, expected values more generally are also quantities that we want to know. If you've, done, if you've done Bayesian inference, you want to know afterwards what is the expected value of some quantity, what is the mean, what is the variance, what are covariances, how do things depend on each other. For, to answer these kind of questions for general distributions, we always have to compute quantities that look a little bit like this. So there is some function which we care about. If you wanted to compute the mean, then that function is just a linear function. If you wanted to compute a variance, then it's essentially the square. The, the quadratic function, and then there is some underlying distribution P, some probability density or probability measure in general that we need to integrate over. So how do we do this? Um, today we're going to focus on one very particular way of doing this, called Monte Carlo. Quick check, hands up, who's used Monte Carlo before? Not, a, yeah, everyone. Good. Not everyone, actually. There are like three people who didn't raise their hand. You're just not, you have, just haven't woken up yet. Okay, so you all know about Monte Carlo. That's good, because you can do a really quick run through. And what I want to do is, okay, so one, one thing we're, we're probably gonna end up doing anyway is like a quick recap of how Monte Carlo works from the very simple idea to the most advanced algorithms out there. So just that we're all on the same page on what kind of algorithms we're working with. But what I also want to do along the way is to reflect a bit on the history of how these algorithms emerged and how they are used, because the main message for today, spoiler alert, is going to be there isn't really a thing, su such a thing as just the integral and, or an integral and one type of algorithm to solve them all, but whenever you're facing an integral, it makes sense to think about why you're computing it. And when you're using a certain algorithm to do so, it makes sense to think about why you're using that algorithm. So here's the history of Monte Carlo. It starts in the Second World War with actually several different people. It's a bit tricky to make out who actually came up with it, but two that are really maybe good con contenders are uh, Stanislaw, Stanislaw Ulam, any Polish people in the room? Probably mispronounced this already, and uh, John von Neumann, um, who everyone who studied ever computer science knows, right? From well, famous for various things, including his, the von Neumann architecture, working in the US at the Manhattan Project. So some physicists have come up with this beautiful observation that um, uh, nuclei of atoms can be split and they create neutrons, and there is some kind of idea in the air that that could, should be used, possible to build a bomb from these kind of 
uh, from this kind of reaction. How do you do that? So the story goes apparently that if I remember correctly, Ulam was in the hospital and von Neumann visited him and they chatted about you know, building bombs as you do. And um, the, the problem they had was that, so the, the reaction is, right, there's, there's, there's an atom, it gets hit or actually it absorbs a neutron and then it splits and produces new neutrons. And those neutrons are fast and they sort of spread out. So what you'd like to do is to use those neutrons to split more atoms, right? That's a chain reaction. But if you just put a bunch of fissible material together in a, in a ball, that doesn't actually happen. So the question was, how do you, what's the right geometry? How do you arrange this material so that you actually get an explosion? And that's apparently surprisingly hard. It's not just, well, okay, if you make a ball that's big enough, then yes, but then you already have the bomb exploding in your lab. You need it such that it only explodes once it's over Japan in this case. So um, they had no computers basically to speak of. So they had to think of geometries and that's hard. So they came up with this idea. Notice that this is kind of an integration problem. There's a bunch of neutrons flying around. You, 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 can, you can optimize the geometry and you'd like to get an expected value for the density of neut neutrons to be maximized in some region. So you need, to you need to compute this statistic, this expected density of neutrons. So how did they do that? They came up with this idea that we can approximate such integrals with sums over evaluations of the function we want to integrate over if the points where we evaluate the function are drawn from this distribution. And we'll see in a moment why this actually works. But first of all, how did they, how did they then proceed? Well, they built a little computer, an analog computer. It looked like this. It's called the Fermi analog computer, the Fermiac. And it worked, so first of all, well, okay, so you can see that it consists of three things basically, two wheels and a pen. And a, the pen has lines attached to it so you can measure directions. And those two wheels correspond, if I remember correctly, to two different settings. One is that there are two different types of neutrons to simulate, thermal ones and fast ones, and that's what these two wheels do. You can see there's a big wheel and a thin wheel. You can switch between these two modes. It's like, a, <laughs> like two modes of computation. And then this thing, which is difficult to see here in this picture from this direction, has like several different um, rings of decreasing thickness, which correspond to different types of material that you can simulate in. And so the way this works is now you take, sorry, bad picture, it's the best one you can find online. Of course, you have to wear your black gloves because it's 1948. And um, you, you hold this thing over a, a drawing of a geometry you're trying to test with a bunch of dice to create random numbers. And then you simulate the path of a neutron by throwing a die to, multi to get a, a, a sample from the distribution of the initial energies of these neutrons that tells you how far they're going to go depending on the material they're in. You're moving this thing, this machine on the surface until these wheels tell you that you've now used up all the energy. And whenever you cross between different parts of different material, you change the mode to keep counting up how much energy you've already lost. And then um, you throw a die again to compute a probability or to randomly draw what kind of event happens next, happens next, whether you get a fission or some other types of events. It's been a while since my nuclear physics classes. And then you, you simulate like a hundred of these paths, basically. So afterwards, this picture is completely covered in black lines. And that gives you a distribution, an empirical one, for where the neutrons are. And you can look at it and say, ah, maybe I need to have more of a bend over here, something, and then we do this whole thing again. And if you do this often enough, you manage to build a nuclear bomb. Which was, well, yeah, so this is maybe a pretty big one, um, which looks more like, a, like a, a hydrogen bomb. We'll get into hydrogen bombs in a moment. Because that's the other kind of inventors for these uh, sm smarter kind of computations. So the reason I'm telling you this story, apart from the fact that it's a nice story, is that notice how this is actually a simulation method. We're not initially trying to solve some integral, we're actually trying to simulate some process. Right? by creating an algorithm that produces a simulation of a stochastic process, but in a very kind of pedestrian, literally, well, kind of hand-walking way, because there's no computers to use yet. So why is this a good idea to do this kind of computation? Well, so 
The idea is to say it again, we're interested in this quantity, which is an expected value. So it's like the average number of neutrons or the average location of the neutrons or the average length of the path and so on and so on. Um, and we're going to replace this integral by this thing, which is a sum instead of an integral, so a finite object instead of an infinite object, over evaluations of this function at points that are drawn from this distribution P. And this drawing is what happens with the dice in the case of the Fermiak. So why is this a good idea? And this is the part you've probably all seen in previous lectures, because this is an unbiased estimator. So what this means is that if you compute the, exp this is now a random number, right? If, remember that this is just a number. It's not a, not a random number. It's just a deterministic quantity. It's an integral. It's the kind of thing you learn in high school. And this thing down here is a random variable. It's the thing you learn about in university. But this random, this random variable has a beautiful property, uh, several beautiful properties. One of them is that, is that it's unbiased. So the expected value of this quantity is equal to this quantity we care about. To see this, well, we just compute the expected value of this quantity. These xs are drawn iid from p. So the expected value of the whole thing, because they are iid, is the sum over the expected values of those quantities. Each of these quantities, each of these terms here is just phi. So we just have a sum over s copies of phi divided by s, which is just phi. So now let me quickly check. Is this too fast or too slow for you? Is this too obvious? You've seen this before? OK, so there's a good, good nodding. So we're, we're too slow. I'll speed up a little bit. Like why is, uh, so, so we now know that this random thing we we, we're trying to compute on average has the correct value. But every single instance we compute has the wrong value, right? Because it's a random variable. So the next question is, how far from the truth is it on average, given that on average it's correct? So if we compute that, we compute the variance of the, this, this random variable. And now, have you seen this computation before? Do you know where I'm getting to? Very good. No, not everyone, but most people, OK? So I'm going to save you this complicated thing of expanding two sums and trying to compute the variance of this estimator. We'll see that this variance is the, so the expected square distance between the random variable we're using to estimate the integral and the actual integral is some constant given by the variance of that function. So that's the expected value of the square of f under the integral divided by the number of samples. So that means if s increases, the error gets small. And that seems to be a good thing. Right? So we have a random number that on average is correct. And if we expand more computation, it gets ever better. OK? So that is actually the entire argument for why these algorithms are a good idea to do. And now there are two caveats. The first one is, is this actually good? So is this a good rate of convergence? Yes. So that means it just, like this, of course, this means that the, this is the expected square distance. So the expected distance drops like 1 over the square root of s, because it's the square root of this thing. But OK, so question again, is this good or bad? So it depends on who you ask. If you're asking a statistician, they say it doesn't get any better because there is no unbiased estimator that can converge possibly faster than this. This is the min-max optimal rate for unbiased estimators. So there's no way to get a better estimate. But if you're asking a numerical mathematician, they'll say, well, this is like the worst possible rate you could, could imagine. It's not even linear. Right? We're looking for polynomial rates. With these simulation methods that Jonathan and Nathaniel and Marvin told you about, we spoke about convergence rates on the order of amount of computation invested raised to some power, positive power, right? Not to like, minus, not, not to one half, but to like four, five, six, whatever. So that seems like a weird discrepancy, which we have to investigate. At next week, we'll talk about methods that have these good convergence rates, but they'll have their downsides. And today, we'll talk about this thing and why it might still be a good thing to do. So the other observation is, that is often usually made at this point, and I used to do it all the time as well, is that the nice thing about this is that this here is just a constant. And notice how there is no d in here, where d is the dimensionality of x. Right? So x, is, x could be a big vector, could be millions of dimensions, and there is no reference to the dimensionality of this problem in here. 
this true or not? So here people disagree again. There's actually a thread that went via social media recently and got pointed out to me because they are citing me at some point. So I had to look at this again. It comes from this blog. I recommend that you have a look at this blog and read it. Um, you can click on the link in the slides. The underline is actually a link. And I have to say, I think there is a bug in that argument on, on, in, in this block, a harmless one that doesn't actually change the argument, but there is still a bug in there. If you can find it, send this guy a comment. Give him best regards like, like from, from the lecture. Um, so his argument is, well, so it looks like there is no dimensionality in this problem. But of course, there is this variance of f under p. And we could think of a situation where that variance has something to do with dimensionality. And that's a bit, it's a bit weird, right? Because we're thinking of this f as a given function. So it's just something. It doesn't really depend on dimensionality as such. It's just you have given a function, right? But of course, there are settings where you can vary the dimensionality of the problem. And you can construct situations where that, as a function of the dimensionality, if you stick within some structured kind of problem that you, where you can vary the dimensionality, you can make this variance explode really badly. And that's his argument. And I actually started writing down the full derivation. Then I realized that there's probably a bug in his derivation. So I think his derivation doesn't quite work. But it, it's essentially true that if you, if you just take care to construct f in such a way that it interestingly behaves in dimensionality, then you can make this variance explode really badly, inc including exponentially fast. However, typically, we're thinking of f as the mean. So the linear function x or the quadratic function and then this usually isn't actually a problem. So long story short, I had to be really careful about this because people for example also cite me and claim that I'm not making this point so I'm going to make this point very clearly. Yes, that convergence rate of Monte Carlo is not independent of the dimensionality of the problem but for most interesting applications of this kind of way of solving integrals, it is very insensitive to the dimensionality of the problem. In the sense that you can use Monte Carlo sampling to solve very high dimensional problems of computing expectations. And the methods we're going to talk about next week will patently not have this property. They will not scale well to high dimensional problems. In a similar way to how no, actually, no. I'll not make that point because it's probably technically just slightly incorrect. So that means it scales, but it also behaves, converges in a questionable way with the number of samples that we're drawing, with the amount of compute we're investing into the computation. So here's the classic example again, just to make sure that we all talk, talk about the same thing. So let's say we wanted to estimate pi which is a stupid thing to do because there's fa fast ways to compute pi. But one way to do it would be to draw random numbers on the unit grid. Hmm? There's this line of Python. Here's the definition of pi. You just draw, draw random numbers. You square them all element-wise. Then you sum them always in pairs. Whenever that sum is less than 1, you're inside of the circle. Whenever that sum is l larger than 1, you're outside of the circle. The area of this quarter circle is pi over 4. Because if this is a unit box, then this is a unit circle, which has area pi r squared. r is 1, so the area is pi. We have a quarter of that, so it's pi over 4. right? And um, so yeah, if you multiply by 4, the average value of those, this binary random variable of being inside or outside, you get an estimate for pi. If you plot this, the absolute error of this way, stupid way of computing pi as a function of how many samples we draw, you get this plot on the right. And you can see it converge towards the truth as a function of the number of evaluations. And it converges with a rate that is given by 1 over the square root of the number of samples. Those are these straight angled lines that I've plotted in. I've also plotted in the expected value for this, which is the variance of um, these random variables. By the way, what's the, how do you compute the variance of this? Just as a sanity check. How do you think I got to this black, solid black line? So for that, I need the variance of this function f divided by n, right? So divided by n is easy. That's how the plot comes about. But what's the constant? So this is a, a Bernoulli random variable that we're computing here. It's either 1 or 0. 
but it's 1 or 0 with a certain probability. And that probability is pi over 4. So it's pi over 4 is the probability, and what's the variance of a Bernoulli random variable? Which so if, if, you if you have a Bernoulli random variable that is positive with probability p, what's its variance? Yes, p times 1 minus p, so it's pi over 4 times 1 minus pi over 4. And that's exactly what this, how I got to this black line. OK, so now, this means with a very small bit of code, like with this one line of code, with a tiny amount of compute, 9 to 10 samples, I get a number out that is correct to one order of magnitude. So around 10 samples, we get something that crosses the 10 to the 0 line, right, where we get sort of 3 on average. That's good. Before that, we get like basically ones and zeros, actually. Um, uh, divide times four, right? So basically four, zero, four, zero, and then suddenly better. Um, and so that's kind of good. But if you wanted to have a really high precision answer, like you know the first 100 correct digits of pi, then well, you can extrapolate this line to get to minus 100, and that takes a while. Probably longer than we have time in the remaining universe. To, to compute. And as simple as this example is, that actually contains everything you need to know about Monte Carlo. That if you're faced with a problem like these nuclear physicists were, where you have just no other way of computing something, and it's really unwieldy, the thing you're working with, and you just want to have a rough estimate, then this is a very smart thing to do. Because it's often quite easy to construct a simulation, to draw from the distribution, and then just watch the simulations and kind of see what they typically look like, basically looking like, sam like, like looking at samples of uh, you know, probabilistic machine learning models. But it's very hard to use this kind of computation to get a precise answer. So if you're facing an integration problem in one of the, some of your machine learning work, then if you want to have an answer by this afternoon without having to work much on the math, this is a smart idea. But if you want to have a precise answer, this is not a thing to do. And it may seem completely obvious, especially if you've had a probabilistic machine learning class. But I think this, this kind of insight isn't really taken sufficiently seriously by most practitioners. There are still very, very many people out there who think Bayesian inference is always Monte Carlo and it's always very expensive. And that is, I think, fu fundamentally comes down to this insight. You're thinking, well, to do Bayesian inference, I need to do Monte Carlo, because that's the only way to compute integrals, right? And that's very expensive, because you have to run it for a long time. And that's not true, because there are other ways to approximate integrals, which can also work really well. They're just typically more work to get to work, but then they can potentially be very fast. So that was the easy bit. That's just what's called simple Monte Carlo. You actually draw from the distribution, and then you follow, you just Stamp simulate a lot and compute expected values under, simu under simulations. In practice, of course, you can't actually draw from p quite often. And so we need ways to construct samples from a distribution that is fundamentally intractable. So once you have a tractable distribution, Monte Carlo turns the intractable integral into a tractable sum. But for that, you first need a tractable distribution from which you can tractably draw samples. And the classic way to do that is what? Before I go to the next slide. Uh -huh, OK, good. Uh, I'm, I'm slowly catching up with your knowledge, I guess. So there are standard ways to take uniform random, uh, random numbers and turn them into samples from some other distribution that work well. Well, OK, up until two years ago, I would have said, which work well for very simple low-dimensional problems. And these are essentially so direct transformations. So sometimes for certain one-dimensional distributions, you can fiddle with pen and paper and find ways to turn uniform random, num random numbers into Gaussian random numbers, into gamma distributed random numbers, into beta distributed random numbers, and so on and so on. OK, so that's very, very basic. That, but that's what happens inside of your random number generator uh, subroutine. NumPy.random is full of these methods, right? OK, fine. Then there are ways like, reje like, like rejection sampling and important sampling, which take standard, typically Gaussian distributed random variables and kind of use them to approximate other distributions. Those don't scale well to high dimensional problems, only to two or three dimensional. And quick like, injection at this point, this is what the story used to be. It's probably the story you 
go to here in your probabilistic probabilis machine learning class as well. But there are no methods that can actually draw from extremely high dimensional, very complicated distributions, essentially by transforming uniform random numbers. And they're called score-based diffusion models. This lecture is not about score-based diffusion models. They're very new, and you've all seen them, right? They drive things like stable diffusion. They're essentially just that. They're just direct transformations of uniform random numbers through a really complicated nonlinear function, some neural network, essentially. But we didn't have quite, quite have time to get, get to that story um, in, for this lecture. Also, or maybe at the end of this lecture, I'll ask you again why we're not using stable diffusion yet to draw from Bayesian inference problems. And you can think for the rest of the lecture, if you're bored by what I'm going to tell you next, why that is the case, okay? So what is the standard way to produce random variables that are distributed according to some higher dimensional distribution? It's called Markov chain Monte Carlo. And that's what we're gonna talk about for the rest of this lecture. Markov chain Monte Carlo, you've already heard the word Markov chain several times. So here's the picture again that was also in Jonathan's and Nathanael's lecture. Uh, methods that are based on a structure that moves, that steps iteratively forward with a finite memory. That's what a Markov chain is, right? So it's the, some data structure where you do a local computation that only depends on some finite local state. Typically, that finite local state is actually the sample we're trying to draw. But we'll get to a point where it's a bit more than that. Just like in simulation, we also got to a point where it's a bit more than that. And the methods that, that there's essentially actually only really just one method of this type, which engenders all the other ones. And it was invented by uh, the people, actually I'll go directly to it because you've probably seen it before. It was actually by, invented by the generation of nuclear physicists who wanted to build hydrogen nuclear bombs. Thermonuclear weapons rather than classic nuclear fission weapons. Um, in particular, the names that are connected with these people are Edward Teller and the husband and wife, Marshall, and I think she's called, oh, I forgot her name already. As so I looked them up before this lecture, and now I just got the first, okay, so husband and wife Rosenblut, who worked on uh, nuclear weapons in, in Los Alamos in the 1950s, 1954 and so on. So they had slightly more complicated geometries to optimize, and they had to use the number generators that were a bit more advanced, and together with um, the mathematicians Metropolis and Hastings, they ended up coming up with this algorithm, which you've probably seen before, the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm which, to remind you, works as follows. So this, we're constructing a Markov chain, so we're going to have a for loop wrapped around what's on the slide. That's the important bit. And now what happens inside? So we go, uh, we are at a current state, and now we're, we're drawing from some proposal distribution called Q, a new location, um, X prime, which, so the typical choice to have in mind is that Q is a Gaussian distribution around your local point. And then at this proposed location, we're computing this, what, what initially looks like a weird ratio between um, the distribution we're trying to draw from at the proposed distribution and the current one, multiplied by the ratio between like, the proposal distribution with reversed arguments. Um, that's the general form. Typically, this is a Gaussian distribution. So xt is the mean of the Gaussian and x prime is the argument of the Gaussian. And because Gaussians are symmetric around the mean, because there's an x prime minus x in there squared, which you can re reverse, those two quantities are actually the same. So this is just one and it cancels out and we only care about the ratio between p at x prime and at xt. If that number is larger than one, we go to that point. So that means if p of x prime is higher than where we currently are, we always go there. And if it's lower, then we go there with a probability that depends on the ratio between the two. So if the step that it has been proposed is extremely low, it's extremely unlikely to be accepted. And if it's very essentially the same value, then the probability is very high to accept it. So one intuition for this is that it's a little bit like optimization with the probability to go downhill and how far, like the probability to go downhill depends on how far you're going downhill. But actually the best way to get a sense for how this works is to use a beautiful, um, use a 
beautiful animation that I'm just going to start and move over. I should have started this before. Sorry. So um, let me go here and move this up. It doesn't come from me. It comes from a guy called Chi Feng. Um, so here's a, a probability distribution. We are going to do mm, Metropolis Hastings. Um, we're starting at some point initially here. And now let me see if I can make this a bit smaller. So initially, we're at some point. We're drawing from a proposal distribution um, a point in here and then check what the ratio is, and um, that's probably not going to be accepted. Then we draw a new point that also doesn't get accepted, and a new point. Oh, and that's now going to get accepted because the probability density at this point is higher than here, so we accept with probability one, and we go there. And then we keep doing this many, many times, and if the algorithm runs for a long time, it's going to produce points that get us um, that produce a bunch, of, a bunch of points first. I'm not calling them samples yet because we'll have to talk about why those are acceptable samples in a moment. Okay? And maybe while we're staring at this plot, because it's kind of nice to look at. By the way, have you seen this animation before? No? No, yes, no, no, okay. Half of you have. Um, then maybe one thing to, to, to notice is just, just, just there, it, sometimes it's really good to look at visualizations of algorithms like this because you can immediately see inefficiencies. So one thing is, Whenever this thing stays at some point, you can actually see the histograms move while it stays at that point. This is a part of Metropolis Hastings. It doesn't reject a point. It just adds it to the count so far. It just stays at some point, but keeps adding it to the count. And then um, we can maybe notice that how well this thing explores depends on how well this proposal distribution is adapted to the entire distribution. So for example, if you make it a bit smaller, then it's going to move around more because it's typically going to be proposed in a region that is close to the current one. So if you're already in a characteristic region of the distribution, then we'll highly likely, highly likely to accept. But if you make it too thin, then we don't move. So we accept every point, but we're basically stuck in some regions. We don't explore. So this is essentially an exploration, exploitation kind of problem, right? So we need to manage, find a point where the algorithm moves as much as possible while also accepting as much as possible. Okay, let me stop this and go back. So why is this an acceptable thing to do, this algorithm? Why does this actually work? So this algorithm has two interesting properties, which are the, the properties you always find in papers on new in, newly invented uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms that are called detailed balance and ergodicity. Who, who has heard of detailed balance before? Ah, now we're getting somewhere. Okay, so detailed balance is this property, which says that the probability to be at some point and to move to another point, if P is actually the distribution we're trying to sample from, is equal to the probability to be at some other point and to move from the other point to the previous point. So if P is the correct P, then the algorithm is as likely to be at some point and move to the other than to move in the other direction, right? So to be at the other point and to move to that direction. And to show this, it's actually quite straightforward for Metropolis Hastings. It's much harder for more advanced algorithms. So we literally just plug in the definition, right? So the probability to move from x to x prime is the probability to propose that point and then to accept it. We accept it with minimum one and this. Then we just move these terms into the minimum. We rearrange, move them out of the minimum again, and we find that we see the thing, the same thing on the left and the right hand side of the, of the equation, and we're fine. So the beautiful thing about this property is that it means this process, this entire process of running this for a long time, has a stationary distribution, which is given by P. So that, what, what this means in math is, if you look at this expression down here, so that's the um, that's, you can think of this as an operator acting on this entire function P, right? So this is this T of X and X prime, this transition operator, the probability to go to X prime if you are with X. That's a conditional probability distribution. But you can also think of it as an operator that, that kind of gets convolved here with X, uh, sorry, P of X. So what is this? 
we, here in this integral, we can, by this line we just showed, we, could, we can replace this expression with this expression. That's literally just from above. Then we notice that p of x prime doesn't depend on x, so we can take it outside of the integral. And this here is just a probability distribution, because it's the probability to go to any value x, given that you are at x prime. Probability distributions integrate to 1, so we're left with p of x prime. So if you have a set of random numbers that are distributed with a density given by p of x, and then this algorithm operates on this entire sort of, in your head, infinitely large set of random variables, random numbers, then they don't change the density of those points. So this is like a station, well, it is a stationary point of this operation. So algorithms that have this property have at least one such stationary distribution. And then the only other thing you have to check is that there isn't another stationary distribution that you might accidentally get stuck in. And this is the slightly more tricky point that is, uh, uh, can actually be formulated in this notion of what's called ergodicity. Um, and this is always a bit difficult to explain because it's, it's a little bit self-referential. It's kind of just writing down the fact that there is no structure, that not insufficient structure in the algorithm to get stuck in some other uh, stationary distribution. So ergodicity of a sequence means that it is aperiodic, it doesn't contain a recurring sequence, and it has positive recurrence. That means if you've once been at, at some point, then there's non-zero probability to come back to that point at a future point. Algor like, processes that have this property have only, uh, at most, one stationary distribution. And our algorithm has this property, and here is that, that's the bit that is kind of nearly pointless to prove. It's, so I'm, I, I can give you a hand wavy answer. So why is it ergodic? Well, because we're drawing randomly, so there's no periodicity. But that's really just saying what I mean by random, right? It's just, it is not periodic. We're not going to do the same thing after eight steps, because that would mean we could predict what happens after eight steps, right? Um, and it has positive recurrence. That is actually correct for Metropolis Hastings with um, proposal distributions that have full support that could potentially move everywhere. Because then there's always a finite probability to move to the point you've previously been at. Okay, so by this property, this algorithm fulfills these two properties that it has at least one and at most one stationary distribution. So that means if you run it for a really long time, it has to be in that one stationary distribution. And that is the distribution we're trying to sample from. The only problem with this statement is that it's just an existence statement. There, eventually, it'll get to this stationary distribution, but we're not saying how fast. And so remember, for simple Monte Carlo, we had this square root convergence, which we already thought was a bit bad. And we, but we also realized it's actually the best rate you can imagine. So this algorithm is going to have a worse rate. And if we do this, so you actually typically get a behavior like this. So this is a kind of insight that comes from David McKay's wonderful textbook on machine learning, that such algorithms often have these kind of local random walk behaviors. You also just saw it in the animation we looked at. And that means we actually have to think of um, a random process that moves on top of the random process we are already trying to draw from. And the number of effective samples that this algorithm draws have something to do with this kind of free, free step length or free time length between two samples at completely opposite ends of the distribution. One way to think about this is to say, if you have a distribution that looks sort of like this, that is very elongated, that's typical for non-trivial distributions in high dimensions, there will be one length scale that is the largest. In this case, it's this sort of diagonal from bottom left to top right. Let's call that capital L. And there'll be one length scale that is the smallest. Let's call that the one that is orthogonal to it. That's tiny. And now, if you make the proposal distribution much wider than this width, as I've just done in this, in the, in this animation before, then the acceptance rate will be very bad. So if, you, if I make this really big, right, then the distribution, it, it will mostly not accept points, so it'll stick around for a long time. Um, and if I make this acceptance, if I make the proposal distribution very small, then every point will be accepted, but we're not going to move at all. So probably we're going to set, set our step size at something like the small length scale, epsilon. And then we're going to get a random walk on a scale of epsilon. So random walks um, keep a, move a distance of square root number of steps. So the number of steps is the acceptance rate times 
number of, of steps taken, right? Um, so that the average distance traveled in time t is the proposal width times the square root of acceptance rate times number of steps. And that means if you solve this number, if you put a big L here, so if you want to travel from one end of the distribution to the other, and then rearrange this equation to get an expression for t, you get that the number of um, time steps you have to wait to get effectively one sample is square of the ratio between long and small uh, length scale. So if you're thinking of a covariance matrix of a Gaussian, then L and epsilon are the largest and smallest eigenvalues, so they are like condition numbers of this, of this matrix, and it's the condition number squared, so that's pretty bad. And that means you'll get convergence rates that are still O of square root of T, but with a huge multiple in front. And you can see this here. So um, the plot on the left is actually just like another way of looking at this plot. So in red, you see the Monte Carlo estimate for the means of this distribution uh, converge to the correct value, which in this case is zero. Why? Because just to make sure you understand, this is a Gaussian distribution with mean zero. So it has two means, one for x1, one for x2. And I, the red points are drawn IRD from the Gaussian, which I can because it's a Gaussian. And if you sum those up, you get those two red lines at the bottom, which converge like one over square root of n multiplied by one. And I'm drawing two standard deviations. Why one? Because it's a standard Gaussian with correlation. And in blue, you see the same plot for these, Marco, for these Metropolis Hastings estimates. And you see that they are still really bad. And actually, a challenge with this is that if you're just looking at the, histo the, the histograms of these, or if you're just looking at statistics of these blue dots without knowing what the shape of the distribution is and without having the red dots as references, it's not entirely obvious how you would notice that this is the case. So this week, your homework is to implement a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, a very specific one for a very specific problem, as you may find out, and one of the things I hope you're going to try is to s convince yourself that you've actually drawn IID samples. And we'll talk about that in the, in the tutorial next week. This is not going to be straightforward because you'll actually have a, a distribution to draw from that is totally unintuitive. So here it's simple, but keep it in mind when you're doing the homework. Okay, so now we have one algorithm that works kind of, but also kind of doesn't work. And we're at 1954 by now. So now since then, a large number of smart people have in, like, completely invested their brains into making these algorithms work well. And they made several really great advances to make them work much better which actually mirror to some degree some design patterns that you've already seen in the simulation lectures. So even though we're, for many of you Monte Carlo is a repeat of something you've heard before, maybe try and find the connections to the other parts of this lecture course that we've been through before. So what, who, who knows, what, what, what is your favorite Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm to use in practice? What's the atom of MCMC? Uh huh. It's a bit less obvious than for optimization. I'll wait for a moment. Yes. Yes. So Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or Nuts is the statement, and so Nuts is a is a variant of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Here is Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Actually, I'll leave that out. Um, so here's who has heard of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo? Not that many people. Okay. And those of you who raised your hand, do you think you know how it works? It's always this, uh, okay, so the, we're gonna talk about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, A, because it's the atom of Markov chain Monte Carlo, and B, because it uses an ODE solver, and we've spoken about ODE solvers in the past few weeks, so let's see how they connect to each other. So here's the idea. We're trying to draw from some probability distribution P of X. Let's imagine that this P of X is, can actually be written as what physicists would call a Boltzmann distribution, so that means it can be written as the exponential of minus some function of x. This is an extremely um, minimal assumption. Pretty much all ever so slightly re like relevant probability distributions are of that form. In particular, basically all of physics. 
In machine learning, we call these models energy-based models. So, uh -huh. and there's beautiful theory about pretty much about how pretty much every density is of that form and so on. So um, that's the problem we're trying to draw from, and we have access to E of x. Now what we're going to do is we're actually doubling the amount of um, variables we're going to draw. So that's like in the ODE filters that you've seen, we take the state space of the Markov chain, which consists of all the x's, and we just, for every x, we invent a second state, which we call the momentum p, or that's just a fancy word for the time derivative for x dot. Okay? And now what we have to say is how that new part of the state space, how that's going to evolve relative to x. Because we just invented it, so it has no further description yet. It's just there. So what we're going to say is that it evolves according to um, a function that defines an ordinary differential equation. Let me first write down the function and then talk about the ordinary differential equation. We're going to come up with some function, which is called h because of this guy, William Rowan Hamilton, um, which has the important property that it, that it contains the energy that we've already used and that depends on x. And then it uses a new function, which we call k for kinetic energy, which only depends on the other type of variable, on p. And in fact, so the typical choice, but it's actually not the only one you can choose, the typical choice is this, which is one half times the, essentially the square of p. So for, the, for your high school physics, you're thinking of one half mv squared, right? So that's kinetic energy. And m is just set to one because it's easy, right? Um, and so if you, want, if you already heard about this and you're bored by this, think about, in your, like, branch off at this point from the lecture and think about how you would do this with relativistic energies. You would get relativistic Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and that's a thing. You can try that. So just imagine what happens to the mass if you want to do it. Okay? So, um, and why that might be a good thing to do and why not. So, okay, but for those of you who haven't heard about this algorithm, don't go there yet. Keep it in your head. And instead, we're just saying we're going to use this function. That's just our function. We just put it in there. And the important thing about this is mostly that it only depends on p and not on x. And now we're defining a differential equation that uses derivatives of this function h. And that is actually an important differential equation that you don't get to change, um, at least not easily. We're going to say that the time derivative of this variable x is given by this, um, the partial derivative of h with respect to p. So what is this? Well, e doesn't depend on x. k depends on p. If we take the derivative with respect to p, we just get p out, right? Simple. And the time derivative of p is given by minus the partial derivative of h with respect to x. And what is that? Well, it's on the next slide, but you can already think about what it might be. Just look at this expression and think about what the derivative with respect to x is. So why is this an interesting thing to do? So the first observation is, if we manage to draw from the p of x and p that is defined by e to this function, then because exponentials work the way they do, um, this distribution factorizes into a term that only depends on x and one term that only depends on p. And the bit that depends on x is our p of x that we're trying to draw from. So this algorithm, if it manages to just to draw from, these, from this joint distribution over x and p, marginally draws from the distribution over x. So if we watch it move around in this state space in x and p, and then drop all the p's and only look at the x's, we get draws from the actual p we're trying to draw from. So that's a first good property. Um, the second good property might be on a few more slides, because first, we need to think about how you actually implement this algorithm. So for that, ah, I have to flop around a little bit in the slides. Um, for that, we need to solve this differential equation, right? And in normal lectures on probabilistic machine learning, I would now go, eh, and for that, you need an ODE solver, right? And there's this magic thing called Doppi5 that you can just call in SciPy and it does it for you. Or you could implement it yourself and there are these algorithms called leapfrog algorithms in physics, actually, which happen to be Hoyne's method. But you've had this lecture, so we can talk about it. How would we actually implement this? Well, here we are. So for this, uh, here is our equations again from above. This is our choice of H. 
we've already found that, the, that the, the, we've decided to model this, the ODE, which for the x, x is time derivative does this, which is p, and I asked you to think about it yourself. So the time derivative of p, which is given by minus the partial derivative of h with respect to x, is minus the gradient of e with respect to x. So now we have a differential equation, which we could feed into an ODE solver, but we could also just implement an ODE solver ourselves. Um, here's the ordinary differential equation with this state space and this uh, right-hand side of the differential equation. And now what we're going to use is what's called Hoying's method, which you uh, heard about in Nathanael's lecture as a Runge-Kutta method of second order. So what it does is, this here's kind of the butcher tableau hidden in this expression, right? So we start at point i and then first evaluate at h half times f of the initial point. That's the first line of the butcher tableau. And then we evaluate again at one h half, well, we evaluate at zi plus the Euler step, basically, and then take the average of those two values. This is, as it happens, actually a wunger kutta method, which has convergence rates uh, uh, order two. And you can also implement it, but now, so this is the abstract expression, right, for the wunger kutta method. This is how you would implement the wunger kutta method in code. But in this case, we know what f is, because it's a specific ordinary differential equation. It's the one that's at the top. So we just plug it in, and you can write down what the Hoyne step is, one forward, directly. So this is the difference between using a software library and actually implementing it yourself by hand. If you do that, you end up with you know, a bunch of Python code that looks like this. You can look at it after the lecture, but instead we can also go back to this nice visualization, reset, and change to what's called Hamiltonian MC, um, and step. So we're at this point again initially, and now uh, what we don't see actually is the momentum, because it's not plotted in this plot, but it was initialized to some random variable at the initial point. And now this is what the ODE solver did. It simulated the dynamics of this Hamiltonian system, with, which is basically a particle of mass one moving in a potential that is given by the log, which en with, with energy given by the potential energy, height, given by the logarithm of this shape, right? And this is what this ODE solver did. Wow, moved around really a lot and ended up over there. And now we reshuffle the momentum, set it to a random variable again, solve the ODE solver again, whoop, and we're at the other point. And that's kind of neat, right? So just two steps, and we move basically from one end of the distribution to the next. That's nice. And we move again, and we accept. So um, maybe I can just let this run for a bit, so you can see it kind of move around, and it produces these nice samples. Now, in a way, we notice that <clears throat> this looks really cool. It moves very fast, right? But notice that every one of these black dots in these, in these kind of snakes requires one evaluation of the log of p. So we should actually maybe compare the efficiency of this algorithm to the corresponding metropolis Hastings that makes as many evaluations as we have black dots in here. But that's actually still better for a reason that we're going to see in a moment. So um, because, but maybe the thing to notice in this animation is that we need a somewhat constant number of steps to simulate. Um, Actually, we are doing a constant number of steps. Sorry, we don't need it. We just set it to a constant number of steps, this is, which is set here, 37. And here, this is the, the, the step size. So this 0.1, that's the step size of the ODE solver, little h. If you make it big, then the algorithm makes big, chunky steps. And you can see already that this is somewhat inefficient because it moves and then turns around and comes back. If you make it really big, it goes really crazy. And if you make it tiny, then it's super precise. But why would we need to do that, right? You can just get really precise answers. OK, I'll stop this. And now, why is this a good thing to do? So for this, here is uh, two interesting observations. Maybe they are actually, yeah, OK. So we can do them in any order. But they are already given away by the slides. So the first thing is, this is a metropolis hastings scheme that always accepts. Nice. Secondly, um, this algorithm makes steps that don't move at a distance that is given by large length scale over short length scale squared 
sorry, number of steps squared or large scale or long scale length scale square root, but instead without a square root. So we basically get rid of this problem. So instead of this, we just get a one here rather than a two, and we'll see why in a moment. So, or we'll see it here. So first of all, um, if our distribution, if we take sort of small steps, if you think of a local point where the distribution is almost a constant function, then this algorithm just moves in the way that a particle with momentum moves, right? It just moves in a basically straight line that doesn't bend because if there are no force, forces acting on a particle, it just moves in a straight line, right? Newton's second law, I guess. F is n times a. Um, so the distance traveled after n steps is given by um, uh, the number of steps times the step size, essentially, of the solver, times a constant, instead of the number of steps and then the square root of it. So we're going to move further. And we saw this in the animation. The second thing is that this algorithm always accepts. And we'll see why. So, the, well, basically the point is that the Hamiltonian is conserved. So the way we chose this, um, uh, this ordinary differential equation, the way we wrote it down, was a hidden way of saying the time derivative of this function h of x and p is 0. And because the time derivative is 0, this joint distribution, wherever we evaluate it, once we have initialized, will always have the same value as the point where we started. So the acceptance probability will always be 1, and the algorithm will always accept. There is no acceptance probability anymore. But we can also write this down as math. So the way we defined this ordinary differential equation means that the total time derivative of this function, h, um, is given by, well, or not, chain rule, right? with respect to the variable x and the variable um, p. And then we plug in these values up here. We notice that they cancel out and we are at 0. So this algorithm draws from a joint distribution over x and p at one constant potential line, essentially. And which potential line are we on? Sanity check to see whether you will follow. Does this mean that? This algorithm gets somehow ma magically ma lands on one potential line and then always stays on that? The potential line is chosen by the initial momentum. So every time step, we randomize the momentum that puts us on some potential line of H. Then we do a simulation that gets accepted because we stay on the same potential line in H, and then we randomize again, and move to a different potential line by changing the momentum. So in a way, we're moving in H, in X and in P space, we just don't really see the P because we just randomize it every step. And of course, while we do that, when we randomize the, 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 the potential, uh, sorry, the momentum P, we, after the simulation step, also change the potential line we are in at x. Of course, because we see it moving between different potential lines, right? OK. And now, um, well, yeah, actually, um, that's largely what I wanted to say about these algorithms. But now, um, maybe we can just actually look at this. The best way to understand this problem is just to look at this plot for a bit and play around with the parameters. So notice how this is, this is a bit like an optimization. It's a bit like Adam. It has parameters. So Adam has parameters, learning rate, epsilon, beta 1, beta 2. And if you've done deep learning, you know that you have to set those parameters and that it's annoying. So this algorithm also has two parameters. They are called, in this lingo, leapfrog steps which is the number of steps that the solver, the ODE solver, is allowed to do, and delta t, which is, given by, which is the step size of our Hoynes method, h. So we can set those somehow. And if we set them badly, the algorithm doesn't work well. So if we set the number of steps to a very large value, then you can see it move out, turn around, and come back. And that's annoying because it wastes computational resources. Right? We start a simulation, and then it, it kind of spends most of the time going back and forth without actually moving. So the overall distance traveled after the simulation is much less than what the simulation did during the run. So you kind of, 
want the simulation and also the, the, the uh, delta t chosen such that the simulation kind of starts, moves in a direction, and when it starts turning around, you kind of want to stop, right? That's the intuition you would have. So that's what's called a U-turn. That's where the no U-turn sampler comes from. Um, so you could come up with an algorithm that basically, so imagine, maybe try this for yourself, right? So how would you write such an algorithm? How would you write a, a subroutine of this algorithm that notices when it has turned around? I'll let you just think about this for 10 seconds. So first of all, you may have noticed that it's already a bit tricky to think about this because, of course, the space might not be two-dimensional. It might be very high-dimensional. So if you're drawing from a thousand-dimensional distribution, it's a bit harder to think about what it means even to turn around. But you could, you know, you could measure Euclidean distance to the point where you started and just watch it as a summary statistic go up. And then when it starts dropping again, you're done. The problem is when you do that, you break detailed balance. You're building an algorithm that is guaranteed to move away and not come back, right? Yes? And the momentum um, doesn't, uh, ah, when the momentum is zero, ah, you mean you, you, move up, you move up the hill and then when it sort of turns around when the momentum goes zero? Um, yes, and that again, I think, would break detailed balance. So the one way to do it, which is like the, one of the algorithms many people use, is called the no U-turn sampler, nuts which um, we can actually, which is best explained by just looking at a, sim at, at a visualization. So what this algorithm does is it actually starts two Markov chains in opposite directions and waits until one of them starts turning around. Um, so that means it, it gets closer to it's the other one that is running away and then draws a random number to decide which of them to use. And it somehow turns out, and that's like a page in the paper, that that actually satisfies detailed balance. And quite often, actually, when Markov chain Monte Carlo methods are defined, this is what the entire game comes down to. So someone has this nice intuition for what should actually work, then they realize that that doesn't quite keep detailed balance, so they introduce more randomness to make it satisfy detailed balance again. And pretty much any algorithm in the Markov chain Monte Carlo or Metropolis Hastings mold comes down to this. Also, pretty much like half of these algorithms are invented by one guy, Radford Neal. Um, this one isn't, like as one example. The one you're gonna implement in your homework actually is. It's a variant of slice sampling, which comes from Bradford. Okay, so this algorithm is maybe an example of one of these numerical routines, where, which is kind of analogous to what we've heard previously for ODEs and for partial differential equations and for linear algebra and so on, where at some point things just get so tricky that it's good that someone did a PhD on it, worked it out, wrote it down, packaged it, and left it to you because this is the kind of thing you might not want to implement anymore. But it's still useful to understand what it does and why it does certain things in a certain way. From the randomness to begin with and the behavior of Markov chain Monte Carlo to why things are chosen in a certain way because now at least you can still understand what that step size actually does. So if someone tells you that you have to work on that, then maybe you can think about how you would set it. By the way, one way to think about the step size is to think about the second derivative of this function and get, let it give you a local scale for how far you're gonna step. This is sort of similar to how an optimization method you might use curvature as well. Um, uh, well, good point. Um, I actually don't know, so look it up. Just read the original paper if you want to. Um, well, there is a way, so there are various, actually in this visualization you can check various implementations of this algorithm. Here's one that um, somehow adapts certain things. Um, another way of doing, of, of adapting the hyperparameters of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is not to use these two different simulations, but instead using Hessian evaluations, so curvatures, to get a sense of the local scale of the distribution and then decide how far you're going to step. And you can see this in this simulation here. So there are various other versions, but at this point, just like there are many different uh, you know, ODE solvers, you don't have to know all of them. It's just good to know at least one decent one. Okay, so 
that was the textbook version of the Markov chain Monte Carlo lecture. So now if you've heard it before, you've been reminded. If you haven't heard it before, you've had it now. And this is the knee-jerk approach to computing expected values in Bayesian inference if you really don't know what else to do. So if someone gives you a probabilistic model, a probabilistic program, so a bunch of variables depending on each other, where um, the initialization of, the random, of, of, the, of some variables is just a random variable and you want to compute posteriors, you apply Markov chain Monte Carlo to draw asymptotically from this joint distribution and then compute expected values of that distribution by basically computing sums of function evaluations. And the arguments I've given you in favor of these algorithms are the ones that you usually hear in lectures on this topic. But there are also reasons why those algorithms are maybe not the best thing to do. We've already come across a few of them. The first one was that this convergence rate seems kind of low. So even simple Monte Carlo, even, the, even if we can draw random numbers from P independently of each other, which we can't do with Markov chain Monte Carlo, but with simple Monte Carlo we could, and Markov chain Monte Carlo only approximates them, even then we are only getting a convergence rate of square root number of samples. And the statisticians I said at the beginning would tell us that that's the best thing you can hope for because for unbiased estimators, there is no better rate than square root of number of samples. So if you want to get out of this, we have to question whether we even need an unbiased estimator. So, and here it's maybe good to kind of take, take a step back and think more from the perspective of a numerical algorithms for machine learning lecture. I think why is there a random number in this computation in the first place? So unbiasedness is a property of random numbers, right? It's not a property of integrals. An integral is not unbiased. An integral is just a number. But Monte Carlo methods use random variables. Why is there a random variable in our computation to begin with? And when you think about it, there is really no reason why. The only reason there is, is that it makes our, 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 uh, our estimator unbiased. But we can only talk about unbiasedness once it's a random variable, right? It's a property of random variables. So there's a weird philosophical jump to say, huh, I'm going to use a random number. So what's the best random number I, I can compute? Well, it's an unbiased one, right? If it, what's the best estimate? Well, it's the unbiased estimate. That's one property of estimates. It should, they should be unbiased. But why are you computing an estimate in the first place? Maybe there's another way of approximating this quantity we care about in a, that has nothing to do with randomness. And that's where we maybe notice that what I showed you today for the entire lecture didn't contain a single actual random number at all. Because what is actually a random number? After my entire career, I still don't know, to be honest, actually. So whenever I start thinking about random numbers, I realize that all the numbers I can think of are maybe not random. So Let's think about a few random numbers. I wrote down a few. Please don't check in the slides if you've downloaded them because I'm gonna, it's going to give away the answers. Here's random numbers, five of them. Which of them is random? So maybe, first of all, I should have asked you, is this number random, right? And the answer is, maybe this gets you to the point where, where well, randomness is a property of sequences, right? It's not actually a single digit. A digit cannot, is not random because you don't know what the corresponding structure is. You have to look at sequences. But sequences are always finite. Sequences computed on a Turing machine are always finite. So here are a bunch of finite sequences. So let's see. Do you think that this one is random? I mean, you've all seen the pattern, right? So what's up with that? There's a bunch of repetitions, right? So what I actually did here is I took dice, which are like your philosophical device to make randomness and threw them. And then I took the, um, uh, yeah, and then just, just wrote them down twice. Right? I just wrote down the answer twice. That's it. But not even more. I, w I think I thought of some cool way to produce longer varying lengths of repetitions. But it's really just whatever came, comes up written down twice. Is that random? 
So it's kind of random and not random, right? Because you can predict, if I, if I give you the first digit, you can predict the second digit, but not the third. And if I dropped you randomly somewhere in that sequence, showed you what the current number is, and then asked you what's the next number, what would your answer be? The same, the same right? Because you're half with probability 50%, you're at the beginning of a pair, so there's a high chance that the next one is actually the same one. Okay, so that sequence is maybe random because I use dice, and dice is sort of everyone accepts, yeah, they're random. We've sort of culturally accepted that they are random. Um, and then I double, but the doubling is kind of weird, right? So what about the second line? Has someone re recognized it? Very famous sequence. <laughs> Marvin is recognizing them. So there are digits of pi, but they're not the first ones. It's the 41st to <laughs> so the 7th, 17th. But there's always someone in the room who knows the first 100 digits of pi, right? So I directly moved it a little bit further. Is this a, is this a random sequence? No? You're shaking your head, so why not? Why is it not random? If I dropped you randomly somewhere in pi, could you predict the next point, the next digit? No. Because there's no structure to the sequence, right? It's an irrational number. There's no patterns. Ah, interesting point. So somehow pi is weirdly finite and infinite at the same time, right? Because we only know a finite number of digits of pi. A lot of them, but only a finite number. So actually, I don't know whether there is an algorithm. Yeah, OK, so there's probably really no way to get to an arbitrary point in a sequence of pi. Maybe there is, so I'm not a number theorist. Maybe there's some weird way of getting there and somehow randomizing some machine. But so clearly, I mean, this is like the most deterministic quantity ever, right? It was, it, it was studied by like the ancient Greeks 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, and found to be somehow absolutely fundamental and like one of the most important objects maybe in our universe. So it's not random, right? But it has no structure. So maybe that's something we want about a random number sequence. Hmm. Okay, so the other, the, other, this, the next uh, line in this is actually also, it's just a safety net for me. So sometimes there's someone who knows digits of pi. It's like, ah, it's a digits of pi. So here is the 1,561st to 1,590th digit of the golden ratio. It's exactly the same thing. It's just a bit less known, but it's just as reliable, right? Just as deterministic. So the next line, is, I forgot, let me check. Oh yeah, that's actually the kind of random number that I've used for the whole day. It's a random number generator, generated random number. Using a particular outdated method, the von Neumann method, and with a particular seed. So this sequence of numbers is, it, maybe it's random. It's random in the sense that we use the word random number. Because those are exactly the kind of numbers we use in computations when we use Markov chain Monte Carlo. But notice how if I wouldn't have told you the seed, it would have seemed random. And the moment I tell you the seed, it's not random anymore. So there's like this private key I have that's called my random seed. And once I reveal it to you, the algorithm is not IID random draws anymore. And here's actually, I can tell you the last one as well. So um, these are digits from a CD containing random numbers. So back in the day when there was no internet and it was hard to get random numbers, there were actually machines that produced random numbers, physical ones that use typically radioactive decay to produce random bits. Um, and you could buy them. And there were different machines from different producers across the world that you could buy. And there was a guy called George Masalia in the US who um, did a, a famous paper checking them for randomness. So he bought a bunch of these machines and then um, random produced random bits and checked whether they are random. So you use various kinds of tests for randomness, um, like basically checking for patterns. So he used the random numbers produced by these machines and then turned them into various random numbers you can think about. Like for example, occurrences of birthdays in the calendar. And then he checked whether um, co-occurrences, if you produced a lot of different birthdays, whether joint birthdays happened at the right rate according to the birthday paradox. And then built like 20 odd of these tests they were called the die-hard tests of randomness. That's what the paper was called. He found that all of these machines were not actually random correctly. They all failed those tests, even though they were physical and supposedly 
totally random. And then he uh, basically did a, a, a parity of all of them, like sort of chained them together and computed a parity of their bits, and then um, released those on a CD. So he like, stored them and then burned them on a CD, and he would send those CDs to people who really needed random numbers for you know, safety critical applications. So I, at, uh, when I did my undergraduate degree, you could already download the CD. That was good that we had internet. So I downloaded it. And here are a bunch of these bits. They are about as random as it gets. Right? They come from really like the thing that banks used to produce random bits. But they are stored on a CD. So <laughs> once I tell you where they are, they are not random anymore. So what this is supposed to get, get across is that randomness really has something to do with lack of information. It's with, about something you don't know, about patterns you don't know, about points in a deterministic sequence you don't know. At least that's the case for all of the randomness that we use in contemporary machine learning. So there are kinds of applications of random numbers where this lack of information of knowledge about where you are in a random sequence actually matters. And those are all the ones where it's all about someone knowing something and some other person not knowing something. So cryptography, basically. Cryptographic hashes use this property. And for them, they typically use a random number generator, but then the seed of the random number generator is the important bit, basically. That, that's like your private key that you keep hidden away. But for the kind of random numbers we, we've used today to compute integrals, it seems totally misguided to talk about this lack of information. So the only way, I mean, if I wanted to phrase this in what's actually going on when you use a Markov chain Monte Carlo method is, imagine you're doing, you're writing a paper about some Bayesian inference on some model. And maybe some you know, real world data, and you're doing Bayesian inference, you want to do sort of, you want to get a good estimate for things. So you write in your paper, I'm going to use Markov chain Monte Carlo. When you do that, what you're actually telling your reviewer is, I produced a bunch of numbers, but I'm not telling you how. Right? I'm only, I was doing it in a certain way, but I'm not telling you how. Why? Because if I'm not telling you, then the estimate is unbiased. But the moment I tell you, the moment I tell you the seed, it's not unbiased anymore. So if someone actually uses the same seed all the time, and you know the seed, you kind of shouldn't accept the paper anymore, right? Because it's not unbiased. But if you don't know the seed, and you don't know how they set them, Maybe it's okay. Now, of course, there are all these nice studies about, you know, you can, there's, there was something on, on Twitter when it was still cool a while ago, uh, of someone doing a, a, a big, big uh, table poll from uh, GitHub to check for people setting random seeds in code on GitHub, and then found lots of spikes in frequency. So when people set their seeds to 0, to 42, to 69, to 420, whatever. Um, and they don't set it to actual random numbers. They also set it to like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or like whatever, right? Or things that, things that just happen if you put your hands on your keyboard and go from left to right, like then you get these kind of weird patterns. Um, so when people use Markov chain Monte Carlo, all the arguments they essentially make for their computation come down to the fact that they are hiding information from you. And that's actually all of it. All the other arguments for Monte Carlo come down to this property that they are unbiased. So when you're using Monte Carlo, you're kind of accepting that you're using, paying this extremely high price for the algorithms, that they converge at best with a square root fast rate, which seems really bad, right? And next week, we'll find algorithms that converge polynomially or even exponentially fast. And the only reason you're willing to pay this price is that there is this beautiful theorem at the beginning that says the resulting estimate is unbiased. But it's just unbiased because I'm using random numbers, right? I'm, I'm approximating something that is just a number. It has nothing to do with randomness. I'm completely arbitrarily injecting the idea of randomness into this problem, then making an argument about how it's unbiased relative to the randomness I just injected that only holds up until I'll tell you how I made the randomness. Because the moment I reveal how my random number generator works, the argument is actually philosophically not, not valid anymore. So here's the real reason why people want to use Markov chain Monte Carlo. It's because it's easy to use, it's easy to implement, 
And you can just start it and walk away from the machine and have the computer do the, the, the difficult job for you. It tends to, you tend to just have to call a method that, uh, that accesses the value of your probability distribution, your p of x, or your log of p of x, or actually just p of x up until a normalization constant, which is essentially the same as, except, as accessing the energy function. Um, and then it just runs. And it happens to work reasonably well in problems of relatively high dimensionality. And I say this very carefully in this way because what, that's another thing that when you really check when people use Markov chain Monte Carlo in high dimensional settings, we rarely ever actually get to hear or get to prove that it works well. It's just that there is no other algorithm to compare to to check whether it works well or not. So we kind of end up relying on Markov chain Monte Carlo because it's the only thing for which we have theoretical guarantees, which rely on the fact that we're using random numbers, which we don't actually have. But maybe they are random enough to kind of accept the mathematical argument. But because we don't know the convergence rates for, Ma for Ma Markov chain Monte Carlo, we kind of, well, just have to accept that the samples hopefully are useful. Now that's a little bit unfair because there are ways of producing interesting summary statistics to check whether your Markov chain Monte Carlo estimate is mixing. And we'll talk about some of those in next week's tutorial. But they are not hard guarantees. They're just tools, like software development tools, basically. Sanity checks to check whether the algorithm seems to be doing its thing well. And we're accepting when we do this, when we, we basically are willing, when we use Markov chain Monte Carlo, to accept a fundamentally very slow and painful laborious uh, algorithm just because it makes it easy for us and hard on the computer. And that's fine quite often because human labor might be much more expensive than the electricity needed to run the computer. But for some settings, and we'll find more in after Christmas basically, it's absolutely not a smart idea to use Markov chain Monte Carlo. And it's much better to think about other ways of approximating integrals. And what we will then notice is that those integrals, of course, these methods will always, have, uh, will always be approximations as well. It's just going to be that the way in which they are approximate will be more structured. So you could think of this as a form of bias, right? There will be a certain ways in which they always tend to go wrong, which you can kind of guess, but not perfectly guess, because otherwise you could correct for them, which are not easily findable in Markov chain Monte Carlo. But that's really more to do with the fact that MCMC is so opaque than with the fact that these other methods are bad. So Markov chain Monte Carlo methods are only correct if you run them forever, and nothing ever runs forever. And they are not actually random, so they're not even correct, because no one actually uses random numbers. Case in point, if you've ever used um, stable diffusion recently to make some beautiful pictures, like I do all the time now for my, for my slides, of course you set the random seed to a fixed value, because you want to get the same picture back the next time you run the algorithm. And there are all these websites of people you know, posting their prompts for these algorithms together with the random seed that you have to set to get the image that you want to see. So what happens on those websites is people say, use this random algorithm in this deterministic fashion to produce this thing that I found. I've been rummaging around in this sea of randomness, and if you fix the randomness in a certain way such that it's not random anymore, it does this interesting thing. I'm not sure that's a property that we want to keep for machine learning for the long-term future. So with that, I'm at the end for today. Next week, we're going to talk about, the, we are going to approach the integration problem from the other direction. We'll look at um, how fast an integral could possibly be computed and what that has to do with inference and with uncertainty quantification. And the price we'll have to pay then, I can already tell you now, is that the algorithms we'll look at will typically only work for low dimensional problems. And in high dimensions, they are, if you're lucky, just as good as Markov chain Monte Carlo. So they, they won't actually break. They'll just be a little bit like Markov chain Monte Carlo. And then we might as well use Markov chain Monte Carlo because it's so easy to use. Okay, thank you very much.